Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable to you today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you put the first slide up, please? With my memory. Have a look at that, just very, very quickly. Can you go back up one, please, Abel? So go back to the beginning. Okay. What words did you see? Anointed. You have to shout. Denies. Antichrist. Receive. Jesus. That's what it's called a word play on. I got um, 1 John 2, 18 to 27, pumped it into some software, and that's the, the frequency of words used in that particular passage. Now, I find it interesting that only one person came up with the word Antichrist from that passage. Yet, when we look at that passage most of the time, Antichrist is the word that we see. The heading is about Antichrist. And that particular thought takes over our thinking and doesn't allow it, allow us to see the passage as clearly as we ought to. If you're old enough, I, I am old enough, um, if you've lived through, the, say, the 80s and 90s, that's the 1980s and 1990s, not the 1880s and the 1890s. Do you remember all the hype that we had when we had those big um, lectures in the twin cinemas back then? That we had them on, on Daniel, prophecy, the Antichrist, the returning of, of uh, you know, the, the coming of the Antichrist into the world, the returning of Jesus. Do you remember all those big lectures that were held? You don't remember them? Well, we went to a lot of them when we were at Central. And I don't want to denigrate the study of these things at all. I don't want to put it down. But sometimes we emphasize it way more than we ought to. And sometimes when we look at pass passages, we see a particular word and it takes over our thinking so that we don't think as clearly as we ought to. These words, they colour the way that we look at the scriptures. It's, they colour the way we read the scriptures. And they colour the way that we understand some of the scriptures. Because we don't see clearly enough. Because we're concentrating on one thing, we actually miss John's intention in this particular passage. John starts with, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard, that Antichrist is coming. Now, they're not synonymous, but this is 2,000 years ago, and it says, this is the last hour. See, something that we have to understand is that John is not being a prophet at this time. He is simply stating a fact. It is the last hour. It's the last hour. It's the end times. We forget that the end times, the last hour, started with the ascension of Jesus. And it will continue until his return. And yes, we, sh we should be looking at times and seasons, see how things are running. But it's been the last hour for a long, long time. It's important for us to understand that this end times, this last hour, is an integral part of human history. It's not an afterthought on God's part. It's not something like he's twiddling his thumbs, waiting 
for Christ to return again. He has a plan and a purpose. Because we, we have to remember that when the end times finish, each and every member of the human race will have had an opportunity to choose. They will have chosen the, so, the side that they want to belong to. And that is an eternal choice. See, I think we need to be careful because the information that John gives us is actually very general. And the Bible, in actual fact, gives very general, very cryptic passages about when and where the end time is going to come about. It's almost as if I get the feeling that God, through the Scriptures, wants to tell us, just be ready. Simply that. Be ready. Don't get too concerned about things. Just be ready. Matthew chapter 24 from 36 says, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. He gives us a clue. It's cryptic. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it be the coming of the Son of Man. I think sometimes God is trying to say that you don't need to. And you probably shouldn't know all of the details. The big thing that we have to remember is this, is that Christ has already won the battle. It's not like he's coming back at the appropriate time. He's coming back when he chooses to come back. The battle will have been won. We just have to be ready. So the first thing in this passage is not the fact that the Antichrist is coming. It's that it is the last hour. 1 John 2.18 says this, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, is coming so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. We, the people who claim Jesus as the Messiah, are being warned that the enemy is active and is opposing the church. The idea of the Antichrist is a central idea in a Christian's understanding of the end times. There's no way we can get around it because that's what the Scripture talks about. It's one of the topics that's commonly discussed and comes up in Scripture However, when we talk of the Antichrist, believe it or not, 1 John and 2 John are the only places those words occur. It doesn't occur anywhere else. And the problem is, John uses the term Antichrist and immediately we associate it with other things. Say, for example, the beast of Revelation in, the beast in Revelation 13. We associate it with that straight away. You know the passage, I saw a beast rising out of the sea and ten horns, seven heads with ten diadem, etc., etc. That's an automatic association. Or, that's two Thessalonians, the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. Or, Daniel 7 or Daniel 8 when we talk about the little horn. Or, Daniel 9 and 11 when we talk about the abomination of desolation. Or, when we get to Revelation 17, the whore of Babylon. These are the associations that we do. But I'll say at the end, <coughs> the word Antichrist doesn't appear anywhere else except in 1 first and 2 John. Now, Jesus talks about false messiahs and false prophets in Matthew and Mark. In Matthew 24, it says, Ben... If anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or 
there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even you, even the elect. See, I have told you before. So if they say to you, look, he's out there in Anunba, or, oh, look, wherever. He's in the inner room. Don't believe it. So Jesus does warn us about the Antichrist, the false Christ, the false messiahs. And even John, in 2 Thessalonians, he writes this, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in the mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us. Now that is in present tense where Paul writes it. So this is something that they've known about for a long time. Either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that one day or that the day of the Lord has come, let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. I'll say it again. We have to be careful because when we read Antichrist, it's only found in First and Second John. Ideas are there. But what John writes next is even more important to the church. We get fixated on Antichrist, but this is actually way more important. He writes, Children, it's the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. This is the part that we should be much more concerned about. Many antichrists have come. That's back then. John's warning to his readers does not seem to be focused on a person. It is on the idea. It is an emphasis that because many Christs have come, we have to be totally and absolutely aware of what's going on. We have to understand that there is an anti-God, an anti-Christ spirit loose in the world that opposes God. Now, we all know that. And this spirit is, this false Christ, as Jesus would say, is alive and vigorously at work in the world right now. And John just says, this is a sign. 1 John 2.18, I'll read it again. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it's the last hour. Because many people are coming up in opposition to Jesus Christ, we know that it's the end time. It's a sign that we can look at. As a matter of fact, it should give us some, some feeling of of um, encouragement. The opposition has come. It's because they're loose in the world that we know it's the last hour or the end times. And John says, don't be surprised. He's saying, be on guard, be prepared. But the warning is actually even more explicit than that because... John wants to know that these antichrists don't come from outside the church. They come from inside the church. People who were part of the church, but then they fell away. This antichrist, they're the ones that perpetrate heresy. They perpetrate error in the church. They perpetrate false teaching. And it's, it is so sad. And John warns that this spirit 
comes from within our Christian community. And if you think about it, if it didn't come from within the Christian community, it couldn't pull the church down. A castle gets overthrown from outside. Only often, not only if, it gets battered down sometimes. But when there is treachery inside and the doors are open from inside. How do we do this? How does this happen? You know, I, we, I was saying before how we want to pull down that wall and make room for other people. But if we preach the gospel, that's not going to happen quite that easily. Because we live in an age where the church is trying to make the gospel more socially acceptable. And that's going to make fewer people come, believe it or not. We're the ones who have to preach the gospel so that people see the difference. See, when we change our theology to be more diverse or more tolerant, or more socially acceptable, then we diminish the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Why come to church if we preach or teach basically the same thing as the Muslim? Or the Hindus? There's no difference in us. We are not salt or light to the community anymore. We're nothing better than to be tossed out. We keep looking for the Antichrist and don't realise that the work of the enemy is often done in little ways. In ways that we in the church don't notice. One of the reasons that we did, uh, said or recited or prayed the Apostles' Creed this morning was this, how do we not deny Jesus Christ? Easily. It's when we deny truth or we say things like, or against, Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. You take that away, you take away something from Christianity. He was born of the Virgin Mary. You take that away, and you take something away from Christianity. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, etc. Take that away, and you take something away from, Christ from Christianity, from our faith. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. You take any of that away. You take he ascended into heaven. You take he now is seated at the right hand of God the Father and is coming back to judge the living and the dead. You take that stuff away. Make it more socially acceptable and you lose the gospel. You lose your credibility. And John, believe it or not, he's actually making the point that it is a good thing that they have left the church. They've been detected. They've been known. They are now known. And we have to learn to stand up. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would still be here. But they went out. That it might become plain that they are not of us. Their leaving is the proof that their understanding is twisted or bent. It's so that they're going out is actually so that we can know true religion, that we can know true doctrine. Now, I do know that sometimes denominations get it wrong, so they drift from sound biblical doctrine, and they're running from the narrow place, path, and I know that, and that is a terrible decision to have to, look, to leave a denomination that you know and love. But I, this morning, am taking it for granted that we here at Walgaroo are faithful. That we here at Walgaroo love the gospel and that our faith is firm and our doctrine is sound. And the reason I'm saying it is this, so that we know how to be more faithful to the word. John goes on in verse 20, but you have been anointed or filled by the Holy One and you have all knowledge. How do you know the truth? In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart these things in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. John is saying that we have the anointing of the indwelling Holy Spirit helping us to know this knowledge. We also have the Scriptures. We have the knowledge to battle the enemy. We have the tools here. We have the equipment. We have the weapons that we need to defeat Satan. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Now I must say that the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us exactly what the scriptures mean. We do have a responsibility to be disciplined. We do have a responsibility to study the text. We have to remember that the Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures. And He doesn't short-circuit our responsibilities by whispering in our ears and telling us what they mean. Because I can tell you, we wouldn't learn that way. You don't win a marathon by someone saying, run. You win a marathon by practicing the marathon. When we pray for help, we're not praying, you know, help us understand. Some of us, I should say, are praying. Bypass everything and just put it in my brain. But the reality is when we're praying for help in understanding the Scriptures, we shouldn't be praying that He spares us the rigorous work and training that we need to do. We should be praying that He will make us humble enough to welcome and understand the truth of the Scriptures. And not fight with it all the time because of our worldly understanding. When we're praying, help us understand is to make us radically open to what we study and then act upon it. Not just make it head knowledge, but action knowledge too. Paul writes in Romans 7, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Why? Because even though the Holy Spirit is living in us and showing us this truth, we have a sinful, natural aversion to it. We fight against it all the time. So in verse 21, John writes, I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. You do understand that the scripture is true. That's probably one of the reasons that we fight against it. But then he comes along and he says, there's no lie in it. There's no way out for you. You have to understand it and act upon it. Otherwise, you go and be with the other people that have decided to leave. Paul's making a similar statement in Galatians 1, verse 8. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you receive, let him be accursed. If it is different to that which we read in here, it's heresy. Stand firm, guys. And it's hard in this day and age because so many churches are meandering, nay, sometimes sprinting away from the truth. Stand firm, John says to the teaching I've given you. Anything else is a lie. But he goes on, God doesn't lie. Jesus doesn't lie. It's all in there. The Spirit doesn't lie. So who does lie? John's point, the people who are antichrist, the people who are against Christ, false Christ, false messiahs. And I have to say, as John says, how do we know who the antichrist is? It's so hard to discern them. And John says, no, it's not. It's very, very easy. He says in verse 
22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? You want to know who is against Christ? Anyone that says anything against who the scripture teaches that he is. But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. He who denies the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. But it's not just denying it. And this is the part that should warn us. Mark 8, Jesus says this, For whoever is ashamed of me, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Now that is Townsville today. But whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father <coughs> with the holy angels. Just being ashamed of Jesus. It's a warning. Paul says in Titus 1, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Jesus says in Matthew 10, Fear not. Therefore, you are of more value than sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me, before men, I also will deny before my Father is before my Father who is in heaven. This is what John's restating in verse 23. No one who denies the Father has the sorry, denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. He's saying a bit more than the repetition of Psalm 14, 1, where it says, the fool says, his, says in his heart, there is no God. That's not quite what he's saying. This is John saying that you can't know God without a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that to know God is to have Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. John is actually saying, it is only Jesus. There is no other way. Being a Christian is absolutely exclusive. I'm going to finish there and we will come back to it because I cannot do justice to this particular passage in just one half hour. So we'll come back to this passage next week. But what I would like you to do, please, is take away the idea, take away the thought, indelibly etch it in your mind and in your hearts. It is only Jesus. There is no other way.